Hi, I'm Jean Schumacher, founder of Simply Plant Based, where I have programs to help you to change your health destiny, including the Plant Based Academy, where I provide help, support, guidance, and resources to switch to a plant based lifestyle, as well as the Pregnancy Advantage, where Dr. Deborah Shapiro, OBGYN, she and I help women to get their bodies pregnant ready or help heal your bodies if dealing with infertility issues. Today, I have the honor of connecting with Dr. Lee Ettinger who's a board certified pediatric nephrologist and obesity medicine, and is a specialist in hypertension. Thank you so much for taking the time to meet with me here today. Thanks a lot for having me. I'm really excited for our conversation. Oh, it's a good one. This conversation that we're about to have is based upon the article in the American Journal of Lifestyle Medicine, of which you are one of the authors, and it's titled Plant-Based Diets and Hypertension. So let's talk about hypertension. (laughs) Okay, just what is hypertension? Well, first of all, let me say I've had a long interest in hypertension. I actually did an 11th grade science project on high blood pressure, which won fourth place at the local science fair. And I had a $5 prize, which I promptly spent on the way home with friends at a fast food joint. (laughs) So I didn't quite make the connection between high blood pressure or blood pressure and food at that time, but I've made, since I've made the the connection. So blood pressure, hypertension is the numbers that you get when you go to the doctor's office and they put the cuff around your arm and inflate the cuff and squeeze and, and get two numbers. And when those numbers are too high, The consensus is that if your numbers are above a certain point, then you have high blood pressure. Okay. Well, when you get that measurement, there's usually two numbers, systolic and diastolic. What what are those things? Right, so when they're measuring the systolic, the top number is when the cuff is maximally inflated. And then when the cuff is maximally inflated, there is no blood actually flowing down your arm. The main blood vessel, the brachial artery that goes down the arm is completely blocked off because the pressure in the cuff pressing in and squeezing on the blood vessel is higher than the blood pressure in the arm. So you've totally occluded the blood vessel. There's no blood flow. So the person listening uh, further down the arm doesn't hear anything because there's no blood passing. And then the cuff starts to deflate and the pressure is decreasing. And as soon as the cuff pressure starts to be less than the pressure in the blood vessel, the blood vessel starts to open up, it's been unpinched and blood starts to flow. But because there is still a pinch going on, the blood flow is very turbulent, allowing the blood or making the blood crash into the walls of the blood vessel, which are the sounds that the person is listening to, the boom, boom, boom of the heartbeat. So when the person starts to hear those sounds, that means that the pressure is at a point where blood is starting to flow. That's the top number, the systolic blood pressure. And as you, so if you're saying a blood pressure of 150 over 90, and as the cuff comes down under the 150, the person starts to hear the blood flowing. And then 140, 130, 120, all of that is turbulent blood flow with each heartbeat because the blood vessel is still being pinched. But If the diastolic blood pressure is say, for example, 90, as soon as the cuff pressure goes less than 90, there's no longer any pinch whatsoever on the blood vessel because the blood pressure in the vessel is 90. And now the cuff pressing outside is less than 90. So there's no more pinch anymore. And the blood flow goes from turbulent to laminar, starts to flow smoothly. And that is why you don't hear the sounds anymore when you're listening. And so the person listening or the machine listening can make that uh, diagnosis of where the maximal blood pressure is, the maximal push of the blood through the blood vessel, and then the minimal when uh, the blood pressure wave passes and there's no longer the turbulent sounds from the pinch. And uh, we get the systolic top number and diastolic bottom number. And it makes you kind of wonder like, why do we care about those numbers going down our arm? Like, are we really worried about the blood going to our fingers? No one's dying. Uh, from high blood pressure with problems in their fingers, but it's been determined to be a good representation of the same blood pressure that's going on in the other more delicate organs of our body, like our heart. Oh, wow. What a great explanation. Excellent. Well, 
I wonder is hypertension a disease or is this a symptom of something going on in your body? Yeah, I think of it more like a vital sign. So when you go to your doctor with a fever, you know, the doctor's checking your vital signs and might detect a fever. The doctor really should look and see what might be in your body causing the fever. Uh, what is in the infection? Where is your body fighting an infection, for example? So when you go to the doctor and the doctor checks your blood pressure and finds it to be too high, that's a vital sign that something might be going on in the body that is of concern, a disease causing this vital sign to be abnormal, just like an infection would cause your vital sign of your temperature to be abnormal. Is there a disease causing your vital sign of your blood pressure to be too high? Well, there's two types of hypertension primary or essential or secondary what's what's the difference primary hypertension is when the doctor after a very thorough investigation cannot figure out what has caused your hypertension and that leaves a few possibilities is it genetic for example or is it your diet or lifestyle for example but there doesn't seem to be anything uh, acutely medically going on in your body to be causing the blood pressure to be high at that moment Secondary or the secondary blood pressure, secondary hypertension is when the blood pressure is to be found on investigation to be due to some problem elsewhere in the body, uh, not in your arm, but uh, for example, if you have chronic kidney disease or heart disease or a hormonal problem that's causing the high blood pressure, then that's considered a secondary cause of hypertension and should be addressed uh, specifically. Okay. I got the million dollar question coming up. Million dollar question. What is the most effective way to deal with hypertension? Yeah, that's interesting. So the most effective way to deal with hypertension is the, the way that the family or the, as a pediatrician, I'm usually working with the family um, with childhood hypertension, but I consider it the way that the family would would best respond to the intervention. So I like to figure out the family's locus of control. So this is a concept from psychology that someone with an internal locus of control believes that their fate or their destiny is due to their own decisions and their own hard work versus someone with an external locus of control believes that a powerful other person or maybe even luck is what's gonna determine their, their destiny or their fate. And I'm not judging one or the other. For example, I take a very internal locus of control about nutrition. I want to really determine my own nutrition to help my own health destiny. Whereas if um, I see on the dashboard of my car that the change oil light comes on, then I have an external locus of control. I wanna take my car to a powerful other person, which is in this case, the mechanic, to fix my problem. So someone within, if I can figure out someone has an internal locus of control and they really wanna take matters into their own hands, that's the person that I really wanna to encourage to do uh, dietary and lifestyle changes. Uh, again, if there's not a secondary cause of hypertension, someone with, for example, with renal artery stenosis and anatomic abnormality causing the hypertension, uh, their diet and lifestyle isn't necessarily gonna fix that problem. But for someone with essential hypertension where there's no secondary cause like that, yes, we, uh, we, it, is recommended, it is recommended that uh, diet and lifestyle interventions happen first. Now, someone with a external locus of control is gonna want the powerful other person to fix their problem. So that's when the powerful other person is the doctor to write a prescription uh, and lower the blood pressure medicine. That's someone who's not necessarily interested in diet and lifestyle. So I wanna figure out how to best help the family. I don't wanna give someone with an external locus of control, a whole spiel, a whole talk about diet and lifestyle, they're not gonna to respond to that. It's kind of like if I went, if I have an external locus of control about my oil change and I go to the mechanic and the mechanic says, here's a prescription for a can of oil, go to the hardware store, buy a can of oil, take it home and here are instructions as to how to change your own oil. I have an external locus of control about fixing the oil. So I want someone else to do it. I don't necessarily want to go through all those steps to do it. Although I could, if I had the interest and the training and the time. So likewise, someone with an external locus of control is not going to respond necessarily to me giving them a whole diet and lifestyle education. 
Whereas someone also, conversely, someone with an internal locus of control might be frustrated if I gave them a prescription, whereas they really want to learn how to handle the issue themselves. So again, no judgment about one or the other. I just want to figure out what's going to best help someone achieve their goals of lowering their blood pressure. Is it the prescription or is it the diet and lifestyle or is it a combination sometimes? But uh, figuring out someone's locus of control can help me help them the best. Wow. Uh, again, that's really a good answer to figure it out because it is it is difficult when you're starting to deal with other people to help them to want to change their health destiny. And when you see the powerful and profound changes that lifestyle can can have on you and on your body and the healing that it can do, doesn't that frustrate you sometimes when you have to write a prescription for someone and you're like, I know you can reverse this without this medication. Yeah, but I know I know that if someone really has the external locus of control, really wants me to fix their problem, that I have the ability to do that. I can write them the prescription. Uh, they'll take the prescription and their blood pressure will be better and I will have reduced their risk of a bad outcome from the hypertension uh, and it can be a success in that way versus someone with an internal locus of control. I really do. I'm glad that I have the skills to help them um, with their diet and lifestyle. Uh, and that can be very rewarding. The interesting thing also is, you know, I never, no one ever said kind of thank you when I wrote them a prescription. <laughs> Mostly the time when I would write someone a prescription, they'd say, oh, you know, how long do I have to take this? Do I have to take this for the rest of my life, for the rest of my life? Whereas it's interesting when, when you teach someone the diet and lifestyle steps to successfully lower their blood pressure, then, then they say, thank you. Uh, you know, they're like, you know, they come back in three months or something and they say, you know, doc, um, I made these changes. I had these benefits. I saw these results. Thanks for showing me that, that neat stuff, you know, that, and that, that can be rewarding. So in a way, yeah, maybe it's a little self-serving that I want to teach them and so that I get that thank you, whereas no one ever really thanked me for writing a prescription. But but I knew that I could help them that way too. Depends on what the goal is. True. Did you ever get any training in nutrition when you went to medical school? Uh, it's I went so I went to Tufts School of Medicine, which actually has a world-renowned nutrition school. And I was actually a volunteer, a paid volunteer in nutrition studies. You know, they would come to the medical school classes and say, hey. Do you like to participate in this research study or that research study? And they would pay us. And I would earn a few bucks. For one, one of my, uh, uh, co another student that I was with, um, she did a study and she earned 1200 bucks uh, back in the 90s to, that she and her husband went on an Alaskan cruise. With. I, was, I was a part of nutrition studies in medical school, but my nutrition education, we actually did get a nutrition education, which I've heard, I've seen studies even that only 25% of medical schools even have nutrition classes. So I did get nutrition classes, but it's interesting. The classes were about deficiencies that just are not seen anymore. Right. Uh, you know, I learned about how to identify pellagra, which is a niacin deficiency. Just these things that seems uh, very obsolete, especially when today's modern epidemic is obesity. The hospital I was working at recently opened a brand new medical school, and I got on the design team for the nutrition classes. So I did teach an obesity class to the first year medical students, and I, I taught them about the plant-based diet, uh, which was fun for me to try to help the next generation of students understand these concepts. Right. Well, and if you do have the internal locus to want that change, then you're going to need help and support because you're going to have a lot of questions because you're going to be changing mm -hmm. your lifestyle. I mean, everything that you've learned for the last however many years you've been on the planet, yeah, is you're going to be changing that. And so you're going to need help. And so mm -hmm. I've created a plant-based academy to help people and provide that support and coaching and education. And I know that you offer as well. So share with us what you offer. Right. So I worked in my hospital in the major medical center in a pediatric weight management program. And I've since left and developed my own pediatric weight management program. Again, for people with an internal locus of control who want to learn how to eat healthier and eat more plant-based 
And so I offer a 12 week program with the support of telemedicine visits with an e-course so that you can learn at home. And I've also coordinated with a plant-based chef so that there are virtual cooking classes to your own kitchen and also a youth fitness expert. She can meet families online and do a virtual uh, exercise classes, depending on what the child's interest is, whether that's getting uh, strength or conditioning or flexibility, things like that. So in that very comprehensive and supportive 12 week program, I'm helping someone, uh, hopefully a family with an internal locus of control who really wanna learn how to take these steps. And then another program that I offer is a four week pediatric nutrition optimization program. Because what I've been frustrated by is a lot of families that I work with, both when I was in the nephrology department and in the obesity management programs, is that the pediatricians would kind of be getting counter advice. So I'd see a family and they say, oh, you know, I I developed anemia. My pediatrician said I should eat more meat or, oh, I need dairy every day. And and so what I really want to help support or families that were vegan or vegetarian or trying different variations of pescatarian, the plant-based diet, that uh, they were getting a lot of concern from their pediatricians or from other family members or friends as they were raising a child. And so I developed a four-week program also to help support families to understand nutrition and to avoid deficiencies and to meet all of these concerns and have kind of a response for all these concerns, protein, iron, things like that. So that's a four-week program. Again, all telemedicine with a, its own separate e-course. And that one's working with the plant-based chef also to learn new recipes and to really give someone a, a nutrition education and a nutrition mastery. So you go through the four-week program and then you take that hopefully for the rest of your life. Again, for someone who's very internally motivated, they've learned how to fix their problems with my support. I'm only licensed in New York and New Jersey at this moment. So I'm also offering the e-courses more widely to anyone online who wants to sit down and go through the e-course. Uh, it's just when you're working with me one-on-one, then we go through it and with more support, more details, but the e-courses are also standalone for people. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you.